had before that was done. Generally, it's something that often doesn't exist anymore as strongly with our fox catcher, like the blues breaker. You see a lot of people doing blues breaker type stuff. Not as saturated as like people copying Bill's stuff or Tube Screamer type things, but um, if you're gonna, if we're gonna take something, if we don't improve for us or make it better or add features or something like that, to put out the same version of that thing that existed 10, 20, 30 years ago, it doesn't seem to make sense to us. So we add features whether there's not enough output from the original, there's not enough gain structure from the original. Um, there's different features. If we're not adding that, it doesn't kind of kind of doesn't make sense. Like, my, it's like part of my philosophy in like often like a band setting, if you do something that doesn't add to the song, we you don't do it. Kind of, you know what I mean? Kind of sit on your hands type thing. So when we start doing something and we do improve upon those things, or again improve upon them, that's what makes it for us to want to do it. That it's different enough. You know what I mean? It started somewhere and it's kind of living now through what we thought it could be, you know what I mean? And to just add on that before we move on, it's the same as writing music as musicians, right? Everything you learn, you learn from someone before. Yeah. So every chord, every new idea that you came up with was inspired out of something else. You know, like you, you, it's not like you were two years old and you picked up guitar and like you figured out the sick chord that no one figured out. You learned guitar and then you figured out this cool chord that you had never played before, but it came from something that you yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I, uh, I think the, the like the sort of like standing on the shoulders of giants thing is very apt. Um, it is very easy uh, in this market to take a tube screamer, um, put the feedback strum cap on a toggle switch, and then say that you came up with something new. Say like, okay, well, this switch says you know like bass cut, a little bit of bass cut, or, or full bass, you know, and it's like, oh wow, big revolutionary thing. And like, don't get me wrong, two screamers sound great in the right context, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but, uh, you know, saying like, oh, this is the next greatest thing since sliced bread, it's like a little bit, uh, you know, demeaning to the, like, the hard work of uh, the people who like invented the two screamer in a way. Uh, it's like, you know, like, uh, there's a whole, a whole lot I could say about that. I think where it comes into my own work is uh, there are so many things that I play where I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Uh, you know, what can I, you know, can I take bits and pieces of this that I like and use them somewhere else? Um, or can I do this in a, a form factor that hasn't been done before? Or can I add some secret sauce that hasn't been done? So like. The long story comes from my experience is playing uh, like a 250 style pedal. In this case, it was a Carolina Leaf Cannon, which is basically like a modified 250 or Ross distortion uh, with a, like a low pass filter, like a rack. So it's just it's a it's a rock and roll distortion. Uh, does not clean up with your volume knob. It you know it it's just it's great. It's loud. It's awesome. Um, and I was running that into an Ampeg V4, uh, which has you know like I was saying earlier the the Baxendall and active mid range tone stack. So you have low and high shelving filters, which cut and boost a big range, and then you have an active like peaking filter that can boost or cut um, and that frequency is selectable and you can dial in so many different kinds of tones with that tone stack um, and so it's a really nice way the nice thing to run a distortion pedal into um, but I didn't know of any pedals at the time now I actually realize there are a few but at the time I didn't realize I didn't know of any you know like okay we're gonna take this hard clipping topology which is all over the place um, and then put it into this EQ um, and so I, I just I did that, and I just added filters and little tweaks here, and you know, uh, added gain one place, removed gain in the other place, until I had something which you know it's based on familiar building blocks, but at least you know I tossed it into a blender and it came out of something different. Um, and then to contrast that, like uh, the dude incredible, the IVP exists as a circuit. You can't buy them anymore, but they're around. They're not very expensive on the used market when you can find them. Um, but no one had ever put it into a pedal before, and so I was like, well, hey, it'd be cool to uh, you put that in there. The first dude. Incredible was actually just a harmonic percolator with extra knobs on it. Um, and then when I was laying out the circuit board, I had like a whole bunch of space left over, and I was I thought to myself maybe I could try to cram a stripped down IDP in here. And so I just just uh, toss it in there. Um, it's just a couple of gain stages, an EQ, and a transformer, so uh, it, it fit in really nicely. And then all of a sudden, I had this shellac in a box pedal. Those designs aren't my designs. Um, you know, again, there are a lot of harmonic percolator clones on the market, but at least I, I, I put one onto a breadboard and replaced every resistor with a pop or a decade box until it sounded sort of like Albini stone, but also sort of what I would want out of this pedal. Um, so if you're taking a circuit, you know, stripping it down to its bare components and then going nuts with it, like that's that's room for new things to happen even without re having to rewrite the whole book. Um, and that's a fun thing to do um, because there's so many different 
I can show you some of these circuits where changing one component uh, alters the entire character of it. Um, and that experimentation is you know, part of the fun of this. So that's my take on it anyway. I myself have never done it because, um, again, really I've only ever designed thus far one circuit. And that was a long time ago. And long enough ago that, uh, I mean, the, the enormous proliferation of, um, you know, the, of, of stuff, you know, pedals that are out now, uh, and it just keeps growing exponentially. Um, that just wasn't the way things were back then. And so there's literally nothing whatsoever even remotely approaching what I was after. So I didn't really have anything to start with. What, and John may already know this, I don't know, but um, what I started with with my original design partner, two design partners sequentially, one guy and then the other guy, um, was I had bought uh, an MSR Distortion Plus at a garage sale for 10 bucks. And um, I hated two screamers. I went over to, uh, a guy's place who was selling a couple of tube screamers and I fired them up and I thought they were not very good. And I thought to myself, well, geez, there must be a fairly significant potential market for something that it really is what the tube screamer purports to be, which is a transparent overdrive that retains the original tonality and response characteristics of your signal. And um, and so basically what I did was, you know, that guy, uh, that original design partner, he was the then fiance of the woman I worked with. And I just shoved the thing under his nose and said, look at how simple this circuit is. Can you help me out? He had just graduated from MIT with a degree in EE and uh, was working at Polaroid at the time. And, um, and so I roped him in and, uh, but that, what's it, what, what is that, like six or seven components that circuit? Yeah, I mean, it's outside the op-amp, yeah, probably like, maybe a dozen. No, I think it's a lot of power supply. Well, in any case, um, <laughs> it's, it's a very, very simple yeah. circuit with a uh, very small number of components, and uh, the circuit I ended up with four and a half years later is 70 some components. So, um, there was that original kernel, and, uh, and that became kind of the topology of the main gain stage. But the main gain stage in the circuit is probably a quarter or a fifth of, <laughs> yeah, of, of what it ended up being. Mm -hmm. And so the topology of that original kernel stayed the same. Values changed, tone shaping changed, uh, clipping characteristics changed, and then the circuit just kind of, you know, got stepped out as I wanted more and more things out of it. And, um, so it was a very long and involved process and uh, really difficult and frustrating, but, um, you know, so it speaks to your guys' point that nothing ever really springs from nothing. Right? Yeah, yeah. It springs from, it's, you know, no matter how much it changes, it springs from something. Mm -hmm. right? Actually, to piggyback on Bill's answer, uh, the long sword, the, the client with the Centaur and KTR, and Brad's Ill Omen all have the same kernel of circuitry that generates a distortion. But the filter is going in and out of it, the filter is going around it, the extra gain stage is going in and around, the controls that we choose to include uh, give three wildly different results. So I, I was going to make a music analogy, and then Copper Sun took that. <laughs> I was going to make the point that the yellow man be inspired by our answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make the point about how the the Omen and the long sword are very similar in topology, and then. John took that. <laughs> so I guess the can like the whole idea of approaching things from different uh, areas, but coming to the same conclusion is huge in the pedal world. And I maybe I'm being naive, but I would like to hope that a lot of people who have ended up building pedals have come to it through that way, not just purely being on forums, seeing somebody else's design, and saying I can make a few bucks off of that, <laughs> which. Unfortunately, we all know that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I dread the day that I wake up and one of my schematics is posted online. It's happened. It's happened to you know to these guys, and it, it sucks. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I get, if somebody asks me for a schematic, I'll be like, here, go for it. Like, <laughs> hey, if you want to build them, 
go for it because as Meg said, you, <laughs> it might kill you if you just start and keep building them. But my biggest factor where I was trying to get away from designs that were already done was the audience I was catering to. Um, when I first started building pedals, uh, this band, Born, got in touch with me and they are like this incredibly heavy doom band and they wanted like a gamey fuzz that wasn't really a fuzz that could do, you know, all this other kind of, all these different flavors of gain in between fuzz and clean boost and that's how I ended up with the Martyr Box which is just circuits out of an electronics book. Like there's, they're transistor circuits. It's, there's only so many ways you can get them to work. So I don't know if there's another box out there that's like the Martyr, um, but I don't know of anything else that sounds particularly like it. But I don't know, it's, I, I think I try to stay really hopeful about the way the pedal industry works, but there's so many clones out there that are just, it's a lot of people trying to make money, and I think a lot of those companies end up folding because they realize it's not a great way to make money, <laughs> especially if, unless you're outsourcing it, it's it's a lot of work. And like I do everything in one tiny room in my house, and the uh, when I say house, I mean a 600 square foot apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and the the small amount of pedals that I sell is a lot of work for me, so I I can't even imagine what some of these other folks talk about. <laughs> Uh, for me, my, my whole philosophy has always been to try and make things in or categories of things that don't exist and aren't available. So, you know, I you now take parts of circuits from other people, but generally the, my purpose for them is completely different than what the pedal I'm taking from is. So, you know, it happens, it's in there, and uh, it's unavoidable, but you, know, you just have to have your own kind of code of ethics or that kind of thing. I also think it's, it's really interesting too how even if you had like a lot of you know, very well, if, if your all of your were assigned homework to come up with you know your version of the two screen or something, mm -hmm. it it would all come out different even if you we all agreed you're going to use the same schematic or mm -hmm. you have to use this particular set of components because you know um, I feel like everybody the things that people gravitate towards or um, I've gone to a program that's totally different, and we may all agree we like a particular, you know, guitar sound on record or something, um, or whatever, whatever, but it's like, we're going to like, there's going to be something in it that each of us finds different. And when Brad and I first met, we were talking about that IC Big Muff, it's like, I had one that I had found that was similar to it, this company got written. Yeah, and um, so Brad showed me the Benefuzz, and I lent him the one that I had found, and you know we did a little AB, and there was like something quintessential about both of them, but each had something special about them, um, and you know it's like I have both of them now, so I've been able to try them in different amps, different guitars, non guitars, um, and it's just like. You know, very similar circuit, but you know, the person designing it or the person putting it together and what they're listening for is going to be totally different. So, you know, I would say, don't steal someone's ideas. It's always, you know, hopefully the person building the pedal um, cares enough and has a specific thing that you're you're looking for. Just like, you know, you know, a lot of times I, I've been saying a lot of times that uh, I've been comparing pedal builders or pedal um, pedals to like bands themselves or an artist or, or a record company or something and it's like you know the reason the Beatles records sound a certain way or like the George Martin Beatles versus the Phil Spector Beatles you know there's still the Beatles but there's a very much a difference between the production as like who is behind the controls and I feel like of that is definitely um, something about the Beatles too. Answer the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question for Phil specifically, but anybody else who's interested in answering. I know that you're very careful about component selection, auditioning of components. Um, 
if you could sort of do a percentage of circuit topology versus that careful selection of, of components, what would you kind of put that percentage as in terms of the final quality of the sound? You know, if you're, if you're trying to push that as far over on the continuum as you possibly can, you're trying, I'm always trying to do that. Minimize the range of variation from uh, production unit to production unit, prototype to prototype. I don't think you really have anything useful if you can't replicate it. Right. You know, it's just like the scientific results. You know, John's a scientist, and you know it's pointless to conduct an experiment and get a certain set of results and get all hot and bothered about those results if you can't replicate them, or someone a continent away or half halfway around the world can't replicate them. And so uh, I think you, what I do is I come up with the topology, or I think you know, one time I've done this, I came up with the topology, and it's not just topology, it's, uh, there's uh, board layout, because there are uh, field effects, even in circuits uh, in which in theory there shouldn't be any proximity effects, any field effects, it turns out they're wrong. And, um, so it's not just topology and component selection. But once you come up with topology and you get an end result that you like to start with, then you try and figure out how you can replicate that. Or how you can squeeze the most of whatever it is you want sonically out of that topology. And that is largely but not entirely component selection. And so there's... Uh, you know, you, you pay more money for closer tolerance components. Um, it's cheap. Everyone knows that it's very inexpensive to have 1% resistors. Um, so, and there's really probably no perceptible difference sonically mm -hmm. between, you know, a 10K resistor that's 1% down from 10K as opposed to 1% up from 10K. I, I, I think that's, I, I don't, I, would challenge anyone to really be able to prove that they can do that difference <laughs> in a circuit. But remember that there's a concatenating effect. So if you've got a complicated circuit like mine, you've got a uh, concatenating effect with all of those tolerances. Every single one of those resistors and caps has a tolerance, and um, the game devices, op amps and so on, they have tolerances too. And especially if you're using transistors, um, transistors can vary enormously in terms of gain, and you know people. I mean, Eric Johnson was infamous for listening to like 30 different fuzz bases and maybe choosing one that he liked, and that was pretty much down to just the gain factors of the uh, the MKT275 transistor. So, um, close tolerance components are important, um, but. A 5% cap that's a certain type of cap is not going to sound exactly the same as a different 5% cap of that same value. You know, they do have sounds. And um, so you got to listen to everything. And it's difficult. It's uh, time consuming. And it can drive you crazy. But, um, you know, if you, like I said, if you want to wring every last little bit out of your design, um, I think that's what you have to do. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, you know, component component selection matters matters a great deal. In that, like, it can go it can go the other way too. In that, if you want to make um, you know, like a fuzz circuit where every single one has like a little bit of like weird character to it, you want it to be a little bit microphonic. You know, you want it to be like a wild noise generator. Then, if you're using you know like I mean, all of your capacitors are microphonic, or you're using a transistor that's like a little bit broken, or uh, you know, you bias it just slightly out. Range, you put all those things together, and it's this like you know sort of beautifully chaotic thing. Um, and on the other on the other side, if you're trying to make like a preamplifier that uh, you know has the same results every time, uh, if you're trying to make you know like uh, like for example a delay circuit that's got both analog and digital components, um, then everything has to be like really uh, buttoned down. Um, there's definitely a sort of like wall martification happening of, of the pedal world on, on one side where you know like uh, companies like Moore you know are making those like little tiny pedals so they can get 50 bucks uh, and the only thing that's separating those from uh, you know something that like one person makes in their spare room um, is uh, that it's you know assembled by a robot or at least nicer components that you put some thought into when you were buying them um, and that sort of thing 
it might, you know, you can dial, you can dial them in to sound similar, but it's sort of like that extra 5%, extra 1% sort of thing. Um, if I built a long sword with all cheap parts and a long sword with all nice parts, you would hear a difference. Um, some people might prefer one over the other, but Bill's argument about consistency, I think, is the most salient point, where if you want something to behave the same way every single time, uh, then you better, you better be careful about what parts you're choosing. Um, and then there's also the sort of longevity aspect. There's, uh, you know, lots of mechanical parts like switches and potentiometers. Um, you know, we recently switched to using pots that instead of a phenolic uh, base, which can wear out after time, uh, uses a fiberglass substrate. Um, they have really nice tolerances. They're very sturdy. They solder well. Uh, Copper Sun recently started using those too. And like, it does make that sort of thing makes a difference because people are going to be turning off. It's the first thing to do. And if one of those pots gives out, then, uh, you know, like that's. That's not a good sign for you. Um, same with, with stomp switches. I, I kind of treat those as a loss leader in a way because uh, I get to find a, a you know like a stomp switch that holds up more than a few years. Um, but you know like that's one of those things where uh, at least you better not be getting the ones that where you hear like chunk every time you step on. Because um, those you know like that's one of those things. If someone's on stage and there's a quiet part and you want to come into like you know like a big heavy riff uh, and the first thing you hear is you know when someone steps on it that sucks for everybody. So uh, you know that that matters too, but um, yeah, that's no, interesting. There's a whole world of parts out there. People go crazy trying to get that like last percent of a percent, uh, you know, difference. And some things don't matter and some things do, but I'd say overall it's very important. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. I think one. <laughs> hey, um, well, I guess two things, but now we're on this tangent. Um, so with, with, uh, with component variations and all this stuff, I know that a lot of what you're doing is uh, done by ear or by experimentation or whatever. Have you guys used tests? It's like, well, how do you even figure out what parameters? Have you even played with that? I guess the second one, which is two for one, is if you guys played with encapsulation to try to keep the pirates out, like, you know, epoxy and stuff like that, what are your thoughts about that? Come on in, pirates. <laughs> uh, when it comes to deterrent, is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, like, that kind based of thing. Based on your design? I'm loaded epoxy. It's like, if you want to get in there, you have to wear out some tools. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of my philosophy on that has been, if a person wants to do what they're going to do, they're going to get through it. Again, Bill's the example that people have found a way to do, you know, take this work. Um, if they want to do that work, I guess they're going to find a way to do it if they want to. Whether you epoxy it, whether you put it in an enclosure, I've seen a company that has it all inside of like almost like a plastic battery case, if you would, like for a 2AA, and they'll have it in there, and then it's actually like dipped in there. You know, that's the biggest fear as a builder. You got to replace that cap, you're probably not. You're just going to do the whole thing. But I always think like if a person wants to do something, they set their mind up to do it, they're going to, they're going to do it. It is, I guess, a deterrent. It's kind of like a lock on a bike, you know? But it's a disincentive. Yes, exactly. It's a disincentive. What is it, you know, you're hoping that somebody's just going to move along to something else. Mm -hmm. Leave you alone. I think Caroline just puts stuff on it. Says, "Circuit thieves, don't put this on the internet." Yeah, just like please yeah. don't copy this. We're a small company. Like, you know, I got a wife and kids. Like, yeah. just leave me be. I think that's even more than epoxy. That's more of like a blow to you morality. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh man, I saw that, and here I am tracing it. Yeah. The first question. Um, so I test equipment and stuff like that. Like, I, I'm trying to build something that has no sound, so I use test equipment all. The time to it's really easy to find, find no distortion, but you guys are doing, you know, uh, flavors and all that kind of stuff like that. So I'd imagine that you want to do that. But then Bill's talking about replication and consistency, and you know, test equipment is a whole lot easier than listening to each freaking resistor. You could just measure them and figure out which ones you want. We we test everything uh, on one aspect. We test everything before it goes into a pedal. So just to, for example, Polaris has so many op amps and so many chips. Uh, in it that uh, it's kind of useless to throw it into a pedal, plug it in, and then realize it doesn't work because one of them's acting funky. So we test, we do test everything, especially on that pedal before we, we finish assembling. Um, but uh, but yeah, part of the, the the cool thing about things being slightly different is the motion factor. Um, but yeah, so. I was going to say, what, when it comes to like the testing type thing, almost going back to like part selection and questioning and stuff like that, 
Uh, it's just rigorous testing through breadboard procedures. We start even with like a base acoustic amp, then we go to like a huge headroom amp, then we try different stuff like that. He'll gig with it on tours, whether live, wedding, stuff like that. Comes back to it, then part selection, constantly questioning it, that whole unexamined life isn't worth living, soccer type thing. <laughs> like, just keep going through it. I guess that philosophy goes to the end, though, you'd never figure it out. But just rigorous testing on everything. You could get out, like, the scope and stuff like that. You know, and but I guess your ears still overpower most things. I don't know how you guys feel about that as well. You know. Yeah, it's you know, like I, I have a scope that I use as sort of you know, like my what I like. I, I tell people like if you're trying to troubleshoot an audio circuit, and you don't have a cell scope. Your base, it's it's blocked. You know, you, you you can't really you know, audio probe will get you will get you somewhere, but uh, you know, if there's something weird like a DC offset or you know something is, is actually malfunctioning, like a scope is your eyes into the into the circuit. Um, like when I. You know, like I, I've been, uh, you know, like trying like all sorts of different methodologies for for R and D, especially with some of these things I'm working on now, which we're using, uh, you know, bucket brigade chips, and just have like more going on with the hood than I've ever experienced before. Um, you know, it's all about like you know trying to isolate different things. I do a lot of simulation to be like, okay, well, I know for a fact this filter stage works and has this you know frequency and cue. I'll stick it on a breadboard. I'll do a function generator sweep. I'm hoarding test equipment from the MIT flea market to try you know uh, all these like weird things that I want to accomplish. Um, you know, function generators are great because you can just put a pure tone through a circuit and see what it looks like spit out on the other side. It's, you know, it is kind of a companion to an oscilloscope. So I love those things together. Um, I have a, a little transistor tester that I use more for germanium than for silicon. Um, but you know, if you're using germanium transistors in a circuit, the variation is, is absurd. Uh, you can find, uh, you know, out of 20 parts, maybe you know, like if half of the, half of a batch of germanium transistors are good, then you're very lucky. Um, and uh, you know, for the dude incredible, we built 30 of them. I bought 65 transistors, um, and those other 35 have been relegated to, you know, like clipping diode duty, basically. Like they're not going to be used in, in that circuit because they just don't work right. They haven't tested well. Um, but if I were to test every single thing through a spectrum analyzer before it went out, uh, that's that's a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, so there's some calibration aspects. Um, you know, you would go inside and see trim pots for bucket brigade ships or JFETs or whatever buys things up correctly, um, and we have procedures for that. But uh, you know, the really intense stuff is more on the R&D side and less so on the production side. But once it works, I assume that the, the parts that I buy are of good enough tolerances to just be happy in in uh, circuit. The homework's before exactly. So, you know, I I. I go crazy during R and D so that you know when we make stuff, it, it's more reliable than not. You guys have talked too much. Do you have any? <laughs> uh, I come from a more repair side of things, so I, I pretty much always use a scope and a function generator just to. I, I'm also living in an apartment building, so the things out loud is generally not a, a really cool thing to do at a lot of the when I'm finishing up. So just make sure. It shows up on the screen the right way, but from my from learning how to do this and from doing R and D and trying all these circuits, making it look cool on the scope and making it sound cool, yeah. very very <laughs> different things. And some of the coolest looking things I've ever seen on the scope don't actually make a sound with a guitar. <laughs> but um, like paper versus practice. Yeah, no, it's it's oh, yeah. and you know for me it's. It's really great to see what it looks like at 1K at that one voltage, but then everything else comes into play. Like you plug a guitar in and it changes everything. So it comes down to your ears in the end, but for me it's really, really helpful. Like you guys were saying, it doesn't make any sense to build something up and pop it in a box and have it completely finished and then step on it and it doesn't make any sound. So I guess a combination of both. Yeah, I <laughs> I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how you guys deal with people giving you like unfounded negative reviews. If you do get any of them. People who just don't understand what they're talking about and will say all kinds of you know hype words and crap about the gear. I, I hope it's a community-based thing where kind of other people from other companies help each other out with that kind of stuff, but. I, yeah. I, well, I was just going to say, like, if you're fortunate like me, you just haven't sold that many pedals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, take I that avoided that. <laughs> uh, the guys, the guys will tell you, I'm, I'm famous for like going on uh, social media or not social media, but, like YouTube and other people's like demos of our stuff. Yeah. And you know, 
like put us up against the King of Tone or something like that. <laughs> Obviously, there's huge fans of one or the other, and they'll just start like bashing the other. And I'd like everyone just to be like PC. Um, but they'll tell you that I'll, I'll, I'll log in under different names. And just correct <laughs> <laughs> <Just, laughs> okay. them, you know, educate them a little bit. It usually works out, actually. Like, popping in and, and under a different name and actually just stating, like, oh, well, actually, if you listen until like, this point, you'll notice that they actually sound very much the same, and that's probably because of this, this, and this. All of a sudden, they're just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got nothing else, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it's really hard for me. These guys seem to take it really well. Alex and I don't, Jordan. I don't read reviews and stuff really. I don't pay as much yeah. to them. These guys do, so they got it covered. I don't, I barely even watch the videos or stuff. It's right. tough one. It's the first the thing. Guys. When you Google search, it's yeah. like a forum with some person yeah. talking. I've seen some something. good stuff, which is cool, you know, but in general, like, Jordan's son will send me, like, yo, check out this thing. I'm like, dude, you gotta stop reading what people say, really. And they'll send it to me. It's the opposite reaction. Like, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like, there's everyone, everyone's got, like, you know, some weird customer story. And you're like, every once in a while, like, uh, I'll get an email from someone whose pedal doesn't work. And I'm like, all right, uh, send it back to me, fix it, good to go. And then you'll get a guy who, send, who posts on social media, hey, my pedal doesn't work, and you guys know how to fix it. And I'm like, dude, I'm right here. Just send me, send me an email. This guy was like, yeah, my long sword doesn't work when I step on the switch. I'm like, send it to me, I'll put it in a new switch, just call it a day. Um, you know, and like, so, for, like, fortunately, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I haven't a lot of like you know reviews of some of my stuff that I've seen. Um, I think I like to think that I'd probably stay away from that because uh, if I'm happy with the pedal, then I just call it a day. And if people want to buy it, they, then you know hopefully it's there for them to buy. Um, it's just I don't really uh, you know like other people's opinions on a tone that I want to have for myself. I can take it because uh, if if something of mine doesn't make you happy, there's a whole world of effects out there, uh, and it's it's awesome that that freedom of choice is like the coolest thing about. Uh, this industry um, from a, a consumer side. Um, from my side, like, I can't meet the demand anyway because uh, I'm so busy. So it's just like, all right, well, you know, go buy it from somebody else. That's great. I'll tell you my friend's company, so go buy from them. Um, yeah, I haven't had any really, like, weird, like, super, like, like bad feedback. Like, I think the worst thing that ever happened was this guy who was like, yeah, like, my model fed, when I turn all the knobs up all the way into my amp, when it's super loud, it feeds back. And, like, that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't do that. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. It's real. When you turn it that way, don't, don't set it that way. Um, you know, and then there are, of course, there are people who are just like, you know, have like weird custom requests. Um, you're like, oh, can you make yeah. me a copy of the Electrochromatics like, Pog? Like, no, I can't. It's not. Yeah. Um, no, period. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, but I think people people are generally pretty nice to me, which I'm very thankful for. So, you know, it'd be worth it. Well, thank you guys, and thanks everyone. Woo.